Okay, on this particular test 8A, uh, this is one of those Chrysler deals. What is, where is the ECU, ICU, excuse me, in, loaded in, uh, located in minivans? The left, the left hand side of the suspension cradle, is that right? You got that? Huh? Okay, on, on uh, those old neons with ABS, where were the proportioning valves located? Uh, it, they're actually in the brake line, and you'll see them on that Oldsmobile out there too. They're in the brake line. It's a little thing. It looks like a fuel filter almost or something. And it, that's basically what they're going back to those close to the rear wheels in the brake line. And when you see that, you need to know what it is. Uh, what's the purpose of the G switch on Jeep vehicles? Well, Say it again. Provides the cab with the acceleration rate. And uh, what's uh, what's cab stand for? Can you guys come up with controller anti-lock brake? That's what Chrysler calls their ABS module. Right? Uh, on a vehicle with Mark 20, and, uh, when an ABS system falls detected, the cab will turn on the red brake warning lamp. Uh, that is false. Okay. Uh, all the following vehicles, which uses a non-integrated anti-lock brake system? Wrangler. Where, where is the G-switch located on Wranglers? <coughs> on the floor pan in front of the... Uh, what? Shifter, not the starter. Blah. Okay, what's the function of the system relay on Wrangler? That's a, that's a big fat D, isn't it? Uh, Orwell anti lock brake system, Orwell 2, rear wheel anti lock brake system 2, is unique because what? And you, technician A says on trucks equipped with Orwell 2, the ABS warning lamp will flash if the cab is disconnected. Technician B says, ABS warning lamp will flash if the axle type and tire size are not properly entered into the cab memory. Uh, that's going to be actually technician B. Uh, the following, the four wheel ABS, um, think about it. If the cab is disconnected, what's flashing the light? Well, why does it say you're going to speed up then? Huh? No, on two of these now, the pamphlets told us something different. Oh, well, I'm right. This is wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me ask you this. What is it that turns on the ABS light? According to the... No, I mean, what what component turns on the ABS light? I mean, what makes the decision to turn it on? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, what, I mean, you found an answer on it. For that. Read, it read the answer you found. Now, let's see if you got it. If you, if you can show me where you got it, then we'll give you credit for that. Meanwhile, we'll move on forward to the next one. The four-wheel ABS on trucks is similar in operation to other anti-lock brake systems, that, uh, except for which of the following? The rear wheel only, the rear wheel, only one speed sensor. There you go. Well, we got through that one. Now let's go through this other one here that we got while he's digging for that answer. And I don't blame you. I'd be ticked off about that too. You got it? All right. Let me see here. Let me see. Make sure I got the right stuff here. All right, you guys, on that, you guys wing that pop test right quick. What do you think about that? You ought to be able to know that. You shouldn't have to look it up or think about it a whole lot. You ought to be that, do that in four and a half minutes. Wing the pop test. And... What do you think about that first one? Hmm? <laughs> Somebody read that first one outside to me and tell me what you think the answer is. Outside. Huh? <laughs> what do you think? <coughs> Anybody know? That's not too terribly hard, is it? Technician A, and this is what we're talking about. Technician A says what? The ABS problem can cause the, the ECM to shut off or inhibit the system. Hmm. Which system? It's not going to. It's not going to keep you from being able to stop as good, except for the fact that you won't have ABS, right? Technician B says a loss of hydraulic fluid or power booster pressure. Hydraulic fluid meaning brake fluid. 
We'll pray. We'll disable the ABS. Who's correct about that? All right. Well, everybody, let's get a consensus on this. What do you think? B. B. Class of, okay, so there you go. Now, inhibit the system, meaning what's mm. what system? ABS system, right? So technician A is going to be right. If it inhibits the ABS system, you'll still be able to stop. Technician B will do that too. See that? So it's going to be both of them. Which of the following is not true about servicing ABS components or the entire system? B. Uh, all base brake parts can be serviced in the same way as they would be if they were part of a non-ABS. That's true. Mm -hmm. The air gaps between the speed sensors and the tooth ring are not adjusted after machining the brake rotors. That is an incorrect answer. Uh, technician B says it's normal for the amber ABS light to light when the ABS is activated during braking. Technician B says it's normal for the red brake lap to light when the ignition is first turned on and the engine is off. The element. Do you usually see the red brake lap when the ignition is first turned on? Yes. Usually I'll see it when I turn it to start. Yep. But not when it's just turned on, usually, right? I see it when it's just turned Depends on. Depends on the vehicle, doesn't it? Yeah. So you can't really say this is a one size fits all answer. So, so what do you think about that? I'd say it's one size fits most. The ABS light does not activate when the ABS is activated during braking on any vehicle I've ever seen. I will tell you what is, though, traction control. If the traction control kicks in, it's going to tell you about that. Uh, when removing an AB, a vehicle's ABS electronic control module wire, wire, yeah, that looks like a fouled up question, right? That doesn't even belong there. That's a messed up deal. When working on a vehicle with anti-lock brakes, technician A relieves system, relieves system pressure by slightly opening a bleeder screw and allowing fluid to spray into a wide mouth container. Technician B aims uh, off, <laughs> turns off the ignition and pumps the brake pedal 30 to 40 times until uh, she feels an increase in uh, brake pedal pressure. What? <laughs> Whenever you remember how I told you you had to pump it to get rid of the uh, uh, the thing? And the pedals are going to feel a little different usually when the accumulator is down. So if you're going to do that one there, you're not going to loosen, relieve the pressure by the loot, opening a bleeder screw. Mm -hmm. You know, and see there, and these people are concerned that wrote this with the, with the situation I talked about where you got that nitrogen charged accumulator. Well, there you're supposed to pump the brakes until it's, you know, 20, you know, a long time. Make sure there's not enough pressure there to blow your head clean off. Okay. Bleeding and ABS is being discussed. Technician A says cracking open the brake line connections at the hydraulic module and bleeding the air. The shop rack is recommended procedure for some systems. Technician B says pressure bleeding is required for bleeding <coughs> ABS. <laughs> wow. Well, I don't know about all that. Uh, pressure bleeding is not... How many, how many of you guys have bled ABS systems? Have you used a pressure bleeder for that? Well, all right then. It ain't required then, is it? That doesn't wash. All right, what about um, cracking open the brake line connectors at the shop manual, hydraulic module, and bleeding the air into it? Now, that's not bleeder screws. That's uh, the lines. Now, that's going to get the air out of the lines, and for some systems, you know, it's probably going to be correct there as far as that. When they're removing a vehicle's ABS electronic control modules, technician A relieves the hydraulic pressure in the system. Technician B disconnects the battery ground cable. Who's right about that? Uh, both of them. When first testing a car with ABS, it's important to do what? I would note the status of the ABS warning lamp. That's important. When inspecting wheel speed sensors, check for all of the following except A, correct bias voltage, B, proper contact between a pole piece and tone ring, C, secure sensor mounting, or D, condition of the tone ring teeth. And that's not all the following except. That's one of those ASC style questions. You're not going to have contact between the pole piece and the tone ring, okay? Bingo. Technician A says, in some anti-lock brake systems, the power brake assist is provided by pressurized brake fluid supplied by the hydraulic accumulator. That is true. Technician B says the uh, ACCT accumulator holds uh, tightly, highly pressurized nitrogen gas is used for, uh, for lower. This is really messed up. There's a bunch of bad letters in here. Power brake boost. Who's correct about that? A. Now, that is typically going to be, the, there is an accumulator that does have a, a nitrogen charge in it. Uh, on some of these, you know, so I would put both of those guys. Technician A says wheel speed sensors generate a square wave frequency signal. Some of them do. 
Technician B says a wheel speed sensor has a permanent magnet. Who's correct? Both of those guys can be correct, but they're not correct about all the sensors. You got me? Uh, because the, the more time goes by, the more square wave ABS sensors you're going to see. All right. Now then, what's wrong with this picture on the board? Anybody see a problem there? Yeah, it's not. The clamp's not on the hose. It's on the part the hose is supposed to be on. Huh. I've seen that quite a few times. Is that ridiculous or what? Yeah, not doing much good. No. Okay. Now I got another picture here. This right here, by the way, showed up in my service bay one day. This guy took all of this apart. He broke that thing down, and it had many, many, many pieces. And he had it in his feet, and he brought it up here for us to put it back together. Don't you do a lot of those kind of jobs? Uh -huh. If you go to work at a shop somewhere where they do a lot of work, you'll see that kind of stuff because customers love to try to fix their own vehicles. All right. Now, what's wrong with this picture here? Yeah, it's good. We have a water pump, and the guy that did this told me, yep, I'm all done. I said, boy, you got through with that quick. And he had to leave as soon as I started pouring cooling, and then it started running out all over the floor. Wonderful, right? Now, what's wrong with this? Screws undone. What we have is a screw, I mean a bolt, let's put a bolt, in a very inconspicuous place that was left loose by a mechanic with no integrity, Especially if that's a, a very important one as well to come apart. Got it? All right. Now I'm going to whip through this right quick. Huh? Uh, I found that question we were talking about. Huh? I found the question we were talking about. What was it? What did it say? That ABS warning, if the ABS failure occurs, the tab will eliminate the ABS warning lamp and administrament cluster via the CCD bus. In addition to the ABS failure, the ABS warning lamp will eliminate if the cab is disconnected. Aha! Listen to him. He's a sharp cookie. You can tell he read uh, that thing. Uh, we all tried to tell you that. Yeah, yeah no. The rest of you guys are a bunch of buffoons. He's the only one that was smart today. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> no, I'm kidding. Good job, Harley. Love that. Because it's on the bus, see? I was trying to get you guys to give me a, a definitive answer. If it's if the bus is what's actually powering that, you can understand why disconnecting the module, the bus would flash the light, right? From whatever module it is. Let's look through this right quick. Thirteen best practices. Now I put some I put these out there somewhere. And here is a good one. Try not to borrow any tool more than once. I used to work with a lot of people that would just borrow tools and borrow tools and borrow tools from anybody they could borrow them from. That's all they studied. Borrow tools. Let me borrow. I mean, let me borrow your fuel line tool. Let me borrow your radio disconnect tools. A lot of kind of stuff. Well, you can buy that stuff, man. Why are you coming to get me to get the stuff if you're somebody who's a professional technician? Now, sometimes your neighbor want to borrow something from you because there's just a one job job. But if a guy's working every day, every day, every day, and he's doing a lot of this kind of stuff, if you have to borrow it once, you better buy one. And that's uh, some people will say. Some people will say if you have to borrow it more than once. You know what I mean? If you have to borrow it twice, you need to buy it. You need to own one before you have to do it the third time. Okay, let's see if we can make this thing shoot. It ain't shooting. I'll just do it this way. I have locked up my PowerPoint. What do I do that for? <coughs> have you ever locked it up? There we go. Don't start screwing an important bolt or plug into its hole and walk away thinking you'll remember to tighten it later. Yeah. Got it? I'm going to start this oil drain plug. Hey, Joe, you got something going on over here? Hey, I'll help you with this. And then you let it down and you put the oil in it and they get spread about halfway between here and Troy or somewhere and all the oil's gone. And, you know, because you just didn't tighten it up. Now, I trained one guy and every time he did an oil change, he would leave the oil plug loose. I mean, it was one place he worked at. And they would say, why did you leave the plug loose? Oh, sorry. The next time he leave it loose again. Why did you leave the plug loose? Oh, sorry. The next time he leave it loose. He was the same way ready to host Why did he get fired? Well, it's amazing to me that the guy who was working for put up with that stuff as long as he did. And it never destroyed an engine, but there was always a little leak where he didn't tie it up, you know. And he just kept forgetting that. I think there was a disconnect or something. I just really hated that, you know. But, uh, you know, they got to do it. Anyway. Don't leave a vehicle with a dry crank, crank case or bad brakes without disabling the vehicle so it can't be started and driven. You know what I mean? You're working on something and maybe some other people working around there and all this kind of thing and you drain the crank case, you can't put the oil in it for whatever reason, this kind of stuff. You leave the key in it 
So somebody can start it up, somebody's liable to start it up, and they're liable to burn it up. You know what I mean? And it's, uh, he, you know, this, he did, I thought he did it, I thought they did it. That's one of the reasons it's, I get nervous when there's two people working on the same job. Because I thought you tightened it. Well, no, I thought you tightened it. Well, now it's loose and pop, you know. we got to seen stuff like that before. If the brakes are bad, somebody can drive over here and knock a car off the lift or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Be careful about that. Uh, when parking a customer's vehicle outside, don't leave the windows down even if the weather is clear. Got me? I actually seen a, a, a lady. Uh, saw, she came and picked up her Thunderbird. Oh, I didn't mention the Thunderbird. And uh, it was a Thunderbird, and the sunroof was left in that tilted open position, and it came a really, really, really heavy shower. And then, the, for some reason or another, she couldn't tell there was a problem until she sat down in the seat, and she splashed water everywhere. And the whole back of her slacks were, you know. And so she comes over here railing on the service man. This was bad news. <laughs> well, see, the thing about it is, check the sunroof, too. You got me? All right, there's the other. Something else you don't need to do. Don't take the keys to trainer home, trainer cars home, in your pocket. <laughs> One day, somebody who shall remain nameless, but his initials are Quincy, uh, parked the Sonata with the windows down, took the keys home in his pocket, and it rained. <laughs> Just flooded it, and then he came home. Sorry about that. Here's my key, you know. So, I mean, you couldn't roll with that. That's the only key I got to it, unfortunately. When doing an oil change along with another service operation like balancing and tires, always complete one operation before beginning the other. I like to get the oil change done in behind me before I ever put a lug wrench on anything. You know, I mean, impact wrench on anything. So, what I have is, I have had one guy over there. Drain the wall, put the plug back in, put the filter on, tightened all that up. Then he did his balance and rotate, forgot to pour the oil in it, was about to start the car up and back it off. What's wrong with that picture? That's not good. So build the hedge. Here's something else. If you've got a pair of pliers that are like Craftsman pliers with the black handles on them that aren't chrome, you know, they're just a plain steel plier with black handles and chrome, if you lay them on the fender, they're probably going to ride out from under there under the hood of that car. I've actually had that happen to me, and then I saw a guy with my pliers that had my name on them working down the. Well, that's what are you doing with my pliers? I found them under the hood of a car. You know, so <laughs> what happens is I took my pliers back. I said, These are mine. You see my name on here? This is my pliers. You know, so he didn't like it. I was liking those pliers. Well, you can get them for $6 at Sears. You know, so. But anyway, nowadays, if I, what I do is I drop them on the floor behind me. Or I put them on my cart. I don't leave them under the hood. Anything you leave laying under the hood, I tell you something else. Impact sockets, those black ones, uh, those things will hide from you. You won't even know they're there. You know these black wrenches, you know that are real sexy looking black, uh, rough finished wrenches. That's the thing that'll hide under the hood, and it'll it will leave. All right. Being a really good mechanic doesn't give you a license to be a jerk. You ever known a really good mechanic that was a jerk because he was stuck on himself? You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, Bobby? Okay. <laughs> he got to look that up. I couldn't imagine Bobby ever being a jerk toward anybody. That's right. <laughs> Don't plunder in the console or glove box of a customer's car just to see what they have in there. Okay, that's their private stash. But what you don't do, but sometimes if you have to pull the glove box out, if you have to pull it out, that's one thing. I mean, but it's amazing what customers leave in their cars. I go in there and find guns, money, all kinds of stuff in there, you know, but it needs to be right where you left it when you get done. You know, so what I was, uh, there was this one old guy that uh, was an uh, old silver haired guy that was a banker from a bank somewhere in another state. And he used to come have his car worked on in the Ford place. And this guy right here was not going to go up without a fight. He had a gun under here. He had a gun in the glove box. He had a gun between the seat. He had a right shotgun in the trunk and a crowbar. You know, so if he got put in the trunk, I mean, in the trunk by somebody that was going to take him off, he was going to, I guess, shoot him through the trunk or something. But this guy just had his car all loaded. He was loaded for bear. Wow. Uh, one way, well, he had a lot of money, too. You know what I'm saying? He got ahead of it. Somebody might try to take advantage of it. But one way or another, leave their stuff alone. You know, like the... Uh, and, and some people are just really nosy in that. But I have actually had to take the console out of Jeeps and stuff. And I take the console out of the Jeep, 
Well, to take the console out of the Jeep, you have to take everything out of the console to get to the screws. There's just no, way, no other way about it, right? Um, put all that stuff in a box over here, a cardboard box. Put it in there just as orderly as you can. And when you get through, stack the stuff in there as neatly as you can. A lot of times it's just crammed in there, you know. It's full, you know, strength, strength. Whenever you do put it back in there, they need to open it up and say, wow, this is neat. You know, just put everything in there really neat if you have to do that. You know, but don't get, you know, into, into their stuff. Don't take any of their ashtray coins or their chewing gum or anything else that you think they won't notice. <laughs> But it's not chewing gum. I was over there at the uh, at the dealership one time just visiting. I got my oil change on my Jeep, and the service manager says, uh, "I noticed you've got a bunch of coins in your, uh, you know, cup holder here." I says, "Yeah," and he said, "I got a guy that I think is stealing change out of people's cars. He doesn't steal at all. He just steals some of it." And he says, "I'm going to try to sting him." And he says, "So when he pulls your car around for you to pick it up." He said before he pulls it around, he colored the, these quarters in a way that they were marked where the guy wouldn't notice, you know, and he dropped them in the coin tray. And whenever the guy pulled the vehicle around there and got out of it, he said, let me see what's in your pockets. And the guy pulled out some of those marked quarters. <laughs> um, and so he gave him his last check, sent him home. Now, what's that guy put on his, what's that guy going to put on his job application at his next job? I got fired for stealing. You know, he may not ever get another job. You know what I mean? Because he says, where did you work? You know, and so he worked there long enough to work, whatever. But anyway, another thing is, and this is something that's always a temptation. You know, you're sort of your mouth's kind of dry, and you kind of like to have a piece of chewing gum. <laughs> and they got one of these 16, <laughs> and you know, you're saying, well, they probably wouldn't miss one, just one piece, you know. Yeah. And uh, but I mean, I didn't ever take any of that kind of stuff because I always try to hold myself to a really high standard. But I was thinking, you know, why is it that every time they come in here, they've always got, it's either full except for one piece, or it's empty except for two pieces. So if you take it, they're going to notice it. Well, that's why you take out one, cut it in half, and then put it back in there. Hold on. Hello. Hey. Oh, pretty good. Give me about, a, give me about five minutes to call me back. I'm in a class. I'm going to do it on a PowerPoint thing. All right. Okay. Uh, don't take any of their ashtray coins or their chewing gum or anything else you think they won't notice. Don't take anything you think they will notice either. Don't change their radio station. <laughs> Turn the radio off if you don't like the music that's playing on there. You know what I mean? I saw a guy one day, that had, somebody had a really nice radio in their car, and he was out there doing an oil change on it, and he had that thing cranked up. And a customer happened to hear that, and looked out in the service department and saw that guy with the doors open on his car and he went into orbit. And so the service manager went and told the guy to pack his tools and get the heck out of there. You know what I mean? Not, it's not funny to some people. You know what I mean? No. But that right there, you know, the, the youngsters among us kind of like to just tailor the radio station to suit us, you know? And, you know, some people I told somebody who told me that, well, I always put it back on the station it was on before I did it. Well, it sounds good, but if you ever forget it and it's the wrong person, you know, uh, something happens, you turn the radio off, you're liable to forget that. When replacing something like a water pump, glue the gasket onto the pump instead of the mating surface because it makes things easier for the next guy. Because if the next guy's changing a water pump, the gasket comes with it. And there's a minimal amount of cleaning on the timing cover or whatever it goes to, right? Also, uh, I always like to use, if I have to use something, you know what works really better for holding gaskets in place than anything else, pretty much, that I like to use more? Is that transmission assembly goo. You know that greasy stuff that we put transmissions together with? That assembly glue will hold that, it's tacky enough to hold that gasket when you put it on there. I don't like to put anything on that gasket if I can get out of it. Because the shop, I mean, unless you got flaws in the surface or something like that that you're trying to fill in with something like Permatex, but the long and the short of it is, if you've got a gasket, from the factory, you don't see them putting a whole lot of sealer on either side of the gasket. Yep. Now, I know some of the uh, aircraft people actually have got some gummy stuff they use. Always respect the next technician and work to make things easier for him or her. The next technician might be you. Because I have actually found myself in a set of circumstances where I'm, I'm sort of pushed for time and I say, well, then, you know, the next guy's probably not going to, you know, like this, but I'm going to go do it anyway. And so, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm in a hurry or whatever, I can't even think of anything. Else. But I have had that same vehicle come back a year later, and now I have to deal with the fallout. 
because <laughs> I have to go back in there and do something else to require a take apart. But anyway, just think about that. If you're going to treat people the way you want to be treated, you're going to basically do it in a way that's going to make it easier for the next guy. Now, here's another thing. I did a job one day. Uh, this guy uh, left, uh, and he had an engine out of a Ranger. It was a warranty job. He just put a crankshaft kit in it. Crankshaft, the parts had to be ordered. So a crankshaft means he's got the timing cover off, and he's got a timing chain off, and he's got, you know, everything all torn apart and all that kind of stuff, and he had it uh, over here to the side. And that guy was the easiest guy to work behind I've ever seen. He had every bolt screwed, started in the hole where it went. Every single one. He had everything disparate, and it was real easy to work behind that guy. I was thinking to start with, they said, you need to put this back together. I was like, oh, I'll throw one of these. But it just, that guy was just so, he was actually looking after himself. You know what I mean? Because he was making it easier for him while he wound up, you know, leaving before all that was over with. And we put it back together and locked it down. I put the motor back in the truck in record time and, you know, made some money off that job. Because he left at the beginning of it, they flagged me for the whole job. See what I mean? Because I wound up whoever finishes the job. In some cases, they'll do a partial flag. Uh, here's the last one. Don't dress like a slob if you want to be considered a professional. One of the things that used to really burn me up is I was, I've always tried to dress professionally. You know, ever since I've ever started pulling steel. Now, my dad used to have, you know, shirts with the sleeves torn out and all that. And he had a, you know, shop in the country. And, you know, he was his own boss and all that kind of thing. But when I went to work at a dealership, I always wanted to wear clothes that were really, you know, shirt tail in, looking good. If you got credentials, wear them on your shoulder. If you don't have credentials, you better be thinking about getting some because that's good stuff to have. These people that were driving these motorhomes says, the last place we had a motorhome was because the guy didn't even have any patches on his shirt. You know, because that bothered him. You know, because they were thinking he didn't know what he was doing because he didn't have any patches on his shirt. You see? Well, the long and the short of it is, if you want them to think you're a professional, you need to look like one. Now, some guys would come to work, uh, and I didn't like that, but I wasn't really the boss, so I didn't say anything to them about it. And they would come to work with baggy, torn up pants, and I want to wear a tank top. You know what I'm saying? If I'm bringing my new Lincoln, or whatever, or Cadillac to a dealership, and I see a guy with raggedy pants and a tank top, with grease all over his face, you know what I'm saying, all the time. And of course, what I usually wind up with is some of these hot summers, my hair's all standing up. You know, but at the same time, you know, keeping your hair combed, that's a personal thing. You know, and a lot of times people just want to be comfortable. But I mean, it's just, you, you, want to, you, want them to, you want to look professional, you need to dress like a professional. And I mean, that means wearing the boots and everything. You know. And so, anybody got any questions or comments about that? I don't like combing my hair. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a toothbrush when you don't have any in it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right. So, all right, now that's, uh, that's just some things I wanted to cover while we were talking over here, this right here. This is something I put together and, and posted. Another guy came along and posted another 36 things. You know, basically it was a grap session he had going. But the long and the short of it is, uh, this is something that uh, you can probably take mental notes on and remember there's a lot of things you can do to make it better for everybody else, you know.